It was like an inch at the top. Gertie is 93 years old. There's a mask that I have for Halloween that's the Cyclops. It's time for the apple seed. It's great to have you with us. In every episode of the show, we listen to great storytellers tell great stories. And we hope that the stories we bring you spark memories that you can share with the people that you love. That kind of storytelling can entertain, inspire, and strengthen you and your family. I'm your host, Sam Payne. And today on the show, two December ghost stories. One of them comes from A Christmas Carol, a story that defined how we celebrate Christmas even today. It was written in 1843 by Charles Dickens. And while the whole story is too big for us to feature on an episode of The Appleseed, we've got a crack team of readers, theater actors standing by to give you a taste of the ghostly visit from Jacob Marley to his old partner, Ebenezer Scrooge. It was not in impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. That was Suzanne Christensen from The Acting Company performing an excerpt from A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, the perfect ghostly tale for the season. Also this hour, we'll bring you another story, inspired a little bit by Dickens' story, but written by me. It's called You Dressed as a Gypsy and I as a Clown. Call it a Christmas card, a Christmas story by way of smartphones, weird little sisters, and even Christmas operas. You'll see. And I hope you enjoy it, too. And right at that moment, his mother's dark bedroom filled with a pale blue light. And in the light, Mark heard a voice. That's coming up later in the hour. For now, let's settle in for a ghostly good excerpt from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, performed in front of our terrific studio audience by members of the acting company, here on The Appleseed. Marley was dead to to begin begin with. with. This must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on On Christmas Christmas Eve, Eve, old Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. The house was dreary, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. Now... It is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door except that it was very large. Let it be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley that afternoon. And then let any man explain to me... If he can. ...how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's Face. Marley's face. It was not in impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred as if by breath or hot air. And though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. That, and its livid color, made it horrible. But its horror seemed to be in spite of the face and beyond its control, rather than a part of its own expression. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in, and lighted his candle. He did pause before he shut the door, and he did look cautiously behind it, as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door, except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on. So he said, Po, po, humbug. And he closed it with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and and the the cellars cellars below below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. 
He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly, too, trimming his candle as he went. Now you may talk vaguely about driving a coach and six up a good old flight of stairs, but I mean to say, you might have got a hearse up that staircase and done it easy. Which is perhaps the reason Scrooge thought he saw a hearse going on before him in the gloom. Uh, half a dozen gas lamps wouldn't have lighted the entry too well, so you may suppose it was pretty dark with Scrooge's taper. Up Scrooge went, not caring a button for that. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But... Before he shut his door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Nobody under the table. Nobody under the sofa. Nobody under the bed. Nobody in the closet. Nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Quite satisfied, he closed the door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise. He put on his dressing gown, slippers, and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire. It was was a a very very low fire fire indeed. Nothing Nothing on such such a bitter bitter night. night. He was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it before he could extract the least sensation of warmth from such a handful of fuel. As he sat, his glance happened to rest upon a bell. A A disused disused bell. bell that hung in the room and communicated, for some purpose now forgotten, with the chamber in the high story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that he saw the bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound, but but soon it it rang rang out loudly, and and so so did did every bell bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute, or a minute, but it seemed an hour! The bell ceased, as they had begun together. And they were were succeeded succeeded by a clanking noise, deep deep down down below, below, as as if some person were were dragging dragging a heavy chain in the cellar. Scrooge remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound! And then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below. Then, coming up the stairs... Then, coming straight towards his door... Rich humbug still, said Scrooge. I won't believe it. His color changed, though, when without a pause it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. On its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried... I I know know him! Marley's ghost! And then fell again. The The same same face... The The very same. Marley, in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights, and boots. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail. And it was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge did not believe it, even now. Though he looked the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him. Though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes. He was still incredulous and fought against his senses. How now? said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. What do you want with me? March. Marley's voice. No doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who are you then? Said Scrooge, raising his voice. You're particular for a shade. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you... can you sit down? Asked Scrooge, looking doubtfully at him. I can. Do it then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair and felt that in the event of it being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me, observed the ghost. I don't, said Scrooge. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know, said Scrooge. Why do you doubt your senses? Because, said Scrooge, a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. 
Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror, for the specter's voice disturbed the very marrow in his bones. To sit, staring at those fixed, glazed eyes in silence for a moment would play, Scrooge felt, the very deuce with him. You see this toothpick, said Scrooge, returning quickly to the charge for the reason just assigned, and wishing, though it were only for a second, to divert the vision's stony gaze from himself. I do, replied the ghost. You're not looking at it, said Scrooge. But I see it, said the ghost. Notwithstanding. Well, returned Scrooge, I have but to swallow this and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins, all of my own creation. Humbug, I tell you, humbug! At this, the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook his chains with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face. Mercy, he said, a dreadful apparition. Why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, replied the ghost. Do you believe in me or not? Well, I do, said Scrooge. I must. But why do spirits walk the earth? Why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me. And witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. Again, the specter raised a cry <laughs> and shook its chain and wrung its shadowy hands. You are fettered, said Scrooge, trem- trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link. And yard by yard, I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. Or would you know, pursued the ghost, the weight and length of the strong coil you wear yourself? It was as full, as heavy and long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty or sixty fathoms of iron cable, but he could see nothing. Jacob, he said imploringly. Joel, Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me, in life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. Pondering on what the ghost had said, but without lifting up his eyes or getting off his knees, Scrooge said, You must have been very slow about it, Jacob. Slow? The ghost repeated. Seven years dead, mused Scrooge. And traveling all the time. The whole time, the ghost said. No rest, no peace, incessant torture of remorse. You travel fast, said Scrooge. On the wings of the wind, replied the ghost. You might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years, said Scrooge. The ghost, on hearing this, set up another cry and clanked its chain so hideously in the dead silence of the night that the ward would have been justified in indicting it for a nuisance. Oh, captive bound and double iron, cried the phantom, not to know that ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed, not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal Life too short for its vast means of usefulness, not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one life's opportunity misused yet. Such was I. Oh, such was I. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business! cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my 
business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business at this time of the rolling year. The specter said, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the specter going on at this rate and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me! Cried the ghost. My time is nearly gone. I will. Said Scrooge. But don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray! How it is that I appear before you in a shape that you can see... I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. It was not an agreeable idea. Scrooge shivered and wiped the perspiration from his brow. That is no light part of my sentence. Pursued the ghost. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my procuring, Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me, said Scrooge. Thank you. You will be haunted, resumed the ghost, by three spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell almost as low as the ghosts had done. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? He demanded in a faltering voice. It is. I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Without their visits, said the ghost, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Well, couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Hinted Scrooge. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more and look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. When it had said these words, Scrooge ventured to raise his eyes again and found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude with its chain wound over and about its arm. The apparition walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the specter reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did. When they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped. Not so much in obedience, as in surprise and fear. For on the raising of the hand, he became sensible of confused noises in the air. Incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory. The specter, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. He looked out. The air was filled with phantoms wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded together and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked as he had locked it with his own hands and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say, Humbug, but stopped at the first syllable. And being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep upon the instant. A Christmas Carol, Stave One, by Charles Dickens.
That was an excerpt from the first part of A Christmas Carol, the Christmas story from the immortal pen of Charles Dickens, performed there by Suzanne Christensen, Leah Kershisnik, and Stacey Wilk, and I got to read a part too, and I loved it. A Christmas Carol is one of my very favorite stories. You know, Christmas ghost stories were more common maybe to our grandparents and theirs than they are to us now. Maybe for them in the past, the nights were colder and darker, lit by coal and kerosene, easier times to imagine the influence of ghostly forces on our regular lives. A lot of Christmas ghost stories, like A Christmas Carol, have lessons to teach us about how to treat people well, how to live our lives better, how to play a useful role in a community, how to strengthen a sense of family. Ghosts like Jacob Marley are examples of folks who learn some of those lessons too late and who come back to instruct those still in the world of the living, like Ebenezer Scrooge. And while December may not be as ghostly as it was in days gone by, it's still a time of reflection, a time to think back on the past year, and even a time to resolve to change for the better without the necessity of being motivated to change by a visit from a spooky ghost. In just a moment, we'll bring in our producers, Brian and Heather, for a little talk back about that story, followed by another ghost story of December yearning. You won't want to miss a word. I'm Sam Payne. <laughs> It was just our pleasure to listen to a Reader's Theater uh, presentation of just a little bit of Charles Dickens' wonderful story, A Christmas Carol. That was just the visit of Marley's ghost to old Scrooge, uh, sort of the event that sets him off on a number of ghostly adventures throughout the rest of the story. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. It was fun to hear that Reader's Theater version. Heck, it was fun for me to participate as one of the readers in that version. There's a lot more coming up in this episode of The Appleseed. Up next, a Christmas story. Maybe ghost story is uh, one step too far, but it is a Christmas story and it's coming up. I'm Sam Payne. Today, we've heard a team of actors reading a tantalizing little bit of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, and we wouldn't feel even a little bit bad if that whetted your appetite to take a new look at the entire story this Christmas season. It's a great one. And maybe our next story is inspired by A Christmas Carol, at least a little bit. It's a story about a guy who has isolated himself over the years, who has driven loved ones away because of his ideas about how they ought to live. It's a story full of weird little sisters, music, and we like to think the hope that blooms amid the winter snows at Christmas time. How will it turn out for our protagonist? Well, I hope you'll enjoy this December story on the Appleseed. Mark's mother was dead, as far as he knew. That much must be understood, or nothing wonderful can come of what I'm about to relate. Mark's sister was dead, too. Her name was Alice. But everyone called her Scooter, and Scooter wasn't really dead, not gone from this world, just gone from Mark's heart, dead, as some say, to him. Anyone who had known their story from the beginning would have been surprised to find things had turned out this way. From the beginning, their story, though marked with sorrow, was characterized by joy and harmony, togetherness above all. In the beginning, when Mark's mother was pregnant with Mark, she got very sick. A doctor thought she might lose Mark and restricted her to complete bed rest for a couple of months. 
And during that bed rest, to help her pass the time, Mark's father, who wouldn't be part of the story later, but was part of the story then, brought her a record album to listen to. It was a recording of the music from an opera written by the composer Giancarlo Menotti, a Christmas opera called Amal and the Night Visitors. It was written for television in the 1950s, and it's the story of the three kings who, on the way to visit the Christ child, stay the night with a widow and her young son, Amal. Amal has been crippled since he was born, and during the visit of the three kings, a miracle happens. Amal's leg is healed. The boy runs and dances and jumps, and Amal's mother, amazed at the miracle, is frightened that he might hurt himself. And one of the kings sings, Oh, good woman, you must not be afraid, for he is loved by the Son of God. Well, Mark's mother, listening to the record of Manati's music and hearing that line, would put her hands on her stomach and whisper, Oh, good woman, you must not be afraid, for he is loved by the Son of God. Hang on, little Mark. Hang on. Well, Mark hung on. And he was born. And a couple of years later, Scooter was born. And by about that time, it was just the three of them. Scooter, Mark, and their mom. And they lived together in a tiny old house. The house was almost too small for the three of them to be living there. Each morning, they did a kind of memorized dance around the tiny kitchen as they prepared breakfast, managing these complicated traffic patterns as one person made toast and one person got out the cereal and milk and one person set out the dishes. Each of them knew the ways of the old house. Each of them knew where the spare front door key was kept in the mouth of the pipe where the clothes dryer vented to the outdoors, right at ankle level on the west side of the house. Each of them knew the ways of Patches, the black and white porch cat that had adopted them. The cat, Patches, that would scratch on Mark's bedroom window on winter nights until Mark clicked the latch and let the cat in to sleep at the foot of his bed. They all loved that cat. And at night, Mark and his mother and Scooter could each hear each other breathing as they went to sleep. It was a happy life together. Except that in those years, there was never any money. They never had two nickels to rub together. It was hardest on Mark's mom. In dark, hard times, she would comfort herself by singing to Mark. And she sang music from that old Christmas opera by Manati. Amal and the Night Visitors, the passage in which the poor boy, Amal, sings to his poor mother in a dark, hard time, romanticizing the prospect of begging for bread. He does it to make her laugh. He sings, We'll walk and walk from village to town. You dressed as a gypsy and I as a clown. We'll walk and walk from village to town. Mark's mother would sing that passage to Mark in their poverty. Mark loved to hear his mother sing. She had such a beautiful voice. And also strange, it was so much like the voice of the singer who played the role of the little boy on the recording that sometimes he couldn't tell them apart. Her singing made him happy, and he needed it. Mark was kind of a serious kid. He was prone to bear the weight of his family's difficulties on his shoulders. And he was naive enough to think that he might, by the sheer force of his own righteousness, make things go a certain way for his family, that somehow he could keep them safe and make them happy and keep them together always in their little house, which is, of course, ridiculous. For his own welfare, Mark was fortunate that his mother's singing made him so happy. His sister made him happy, too, weird though she was. 
Scooter had this weird sense of humor that kept everyone rolling forward when things got too serious. When Mark was a brand new teenager and Scooter was about 11, Mark spent a brief period fancying himself an animal activist. He pulled a poster of a timber wolf from the pages of a National Geographic magazine and with liquid paper across the bottom of the poster, he painted the words, Save the Wolves. And for his birthday that year, Scooter made him a card out of a piece of construction paper folded in half. And on the inside of the card, she pasted a photo she had cut from a magazine. It was a photo of a freshly shorn sheep. And over the head of the sheep, she had pasted a photo of the head of a wolf, also cut from a magazine, so that the total picture looked like a freshly shorn wolf. And above the picture, she wrote, Happy Birthday, Mark, with a crayon. And below the picture, she wrote in capital letters, Shave the Wolves. And she thought that was the funniest thing in the world. And Mark thought it was funny, too. Scooter dragged a doll around with her. Even when she was older than most kids are when they lay down their dolls, she'd had this doll for years, and she named it after the most beautiful word she could ever remember reading when she was small. The doll's name was Dayquiry. No one had ever thought to point out to her the disparity between the real word, the word daiquiri, and Scooter's pronunciation, dayquiry. Maybe you know a kid who pronounces something in a weird way, but it's so cute that you just let her keep doing it. It was that way with Day Query. And Scooter also drew stuff, weird pictures of cows with surprised looks on their faces or of banditos firing mice into the air out of slingshots, all sorts of stuff. And she drew them everywhere, on paper, sure, but also on the walls of her bedroom and on the bathroom sink and at least once on Mark's Sunday shoes. And Mark loved her. He tried to love her like Mark's mother loved him, by sharing music that was important to him. And Menotti's opera, Amal and the Night Visitors, had remained important to him. That was the first thing he had downloaded onto his phone when he got one. But mostly, he shared James Taylor songs with Scooter. He sang, shower the people you love with love to her. And I've seen fire and I've seen rain, of course. But also all those wonderful songs filled with such rich stories. The song about the frozen man. The one that says, last thing I remember is the freezing cold. Water reaching up just to swallow me whole. Ice in the rigging and the howling wind. Shock to my body as we tumble in. He sang that song. And he sang the song about the mill worker, the one that says, My mind begins to wander to the days back on the farm, and I can see my father smiling at me, swinging on his arm, and I can hear my granddad's stories of the storms out on Lake Erie, where vessels and cargo and fortunes and sailors' lives were lost. He sang those songs to her. And it was a great gift to Mark that those songs seemed to go down so deep into Scooter and that she really seemed to love them like Mark did. And maybe that's why it's such an irony that when a wedge was finally driven between Mark and Scooter, when Mark was in college and Scooter had just graduated from high school, it was over a James Taylor song. They fought over the song Enough to Be On Your Way, that lovely, sorrowful song with the lyrics, The last time I saw Alice, she was leaving Santa Fe with a bunch of round-eyed Buddhists in a killer Chevrolet. Scooter heard that song, and she just thrilled to it. She took it as justification for a dream she'd had for a long time, to shave her head and move to L.A. and be an actress. And Mark, who believed in the virtue of staying close by home to be nurtured by the faith and family of one's youth, cried out to Scooter, don't you hear the sorrow in that song? It's not a song about life, Scooter. It's a song about death. And he called her an idiot. And she left for L.A. And Mark went to his mother to weep about it. And she told him, that maybe he needed to go easy on Scooter, that maybe she knew what she wanted and that he should just let her do the things she had planned for herself in her life. But Scooter had betrayed Mark by using a James Taylor song to launch her away from home, away from the brother who had tried to love her so well. And in the face of that betrayal, 
Mark's mother taking Scooter's side, was too much for Mark to bear. He was already driving across the valley to college every morning anyway, so he moved out of the house, and he stopped speaking to his mother. Now, in a story filling up with ironies, it might be the bitterest irony yet that right about when Mark moved out of the house, his mother began to get sick. She went downhill very quickly, and it wasn't long before she had to move from the old house and into the care of some of her cousins somewhere else in the valley. She called Mark to tell him about it from the old yellow telephone in the kitchen. But Mark was still in the heat of anger, and he wasn't answering calls from his mother. She left him a message, and he erased the message without listening to it. As it was, other relatives moved the furniture from the house. They began to care for Mark's mother. And as Mark was so deliberately absent, they stopped keeping him in the loop. He had made himself, it seemed, dead, dead to them. With Mark's mother's illness progressing as it did, there wasn't any time to dismantle systems that had been in place for so many years, or at least nobody did it, so her bank accounts still continued to automatically pay the meager mortgage on the old place, and the phone bill, and utilities, and every once in a while, the relatives used the place as a kind of a hole-up for some young married couple in the family or among their friends. Mark, who never spoke to his mother, only knew through what he'd heard very occasionally around town that his mother had slipped into her illness far enough and fast enough that it had very quickly become too late for them to reconcile. Before he knew it, she was gone from him altogether. In years past, and some people say time heals all wounds. But as the years went by, Mark felt more and more bitter about his sister and more and more bitter about his mother. More bitter, he felt, and more righteous. And on nights when he felt particularly bitter or particularly righteous, he would drive silently through the town where he had grown up. He'd glide up onto the top of Cemetery Hill and look down on his elementary school, and then he'd come down and move along the streets where the old house stood. He'd pass the place, and he'd exhale, and sometimes he'd loop around the horse pasture next to the old place and drive past again. And then, his haunting of the place at an end, he'd head back across the valley to his apartment. Nobody would have understood why he made these nighttime drives, and maybe he didn't know himself. Maybe it was his way of showing the universe that he, Mark, in a shifting world, had not shifted. Just Mark's way of shaking his fist at the people who had gone away without acknowledging the virtue of the one who stayed. And so it was that one Christmas Eve, Mark found himself driving the neighborhood in bitterness and righteousness. Deep snow had fallen in the yards and on the roofs and on the road, and as such, his car floated down the road with a special silence. Mark made his rounds into town. He tried to go up onto Cemetery Hill, but the snow was too deep. He gunned his engine as the car slid, and he thought, if I try any harder, I might dig myself in far enough that I can't ever get out. So he backed down off the hill and onto the road again. And he drove down into his neighborhood and he passed the old house. Only this time, he stopped. He pulled right into the driveway. Tonight was different. Standing in the yard of the old house was a sign that read in big red letters, for sale. Mark took in a long breath and then let it out again, clearly with his mother gone for so many years and the kids of all her cousins grown and in homes of their own, the family was selling the old house. For a long time, Mark sat in the driveway looking at the old place in the dark 
illuminated by his headlights and by the moon. He didn't say anything. He just breathed in and out. Then, after a while, Mark began to turn the key and start the car to drive away. And that might have been it. There might have been no story to tell beyond that. But as he was turning the key, he heard a little sound outside the driver's side door. It was a scratching sound. Mark opened the door to see what it was. And in the snow outside the car was a black and white cat. It was unmistakable. Patches, Mark said. The cat flicked its tail, jumped into the car, scrambled over Mark's lap to flex its paws on the passenger seat, making itself comfortable. No, Mark said. He picked up the cat, and before he knew it, he was standing outside the car, holding the cat in his arms. He had meant only to spend a moment or two looking for a warm place for the cat to ride out the storm, but... As he stood there in the yard, he began to wonder. The house was clearly empty, so Mark walked around to the side of the house, patches purring against his chest, and Mark wondered a little harder. He got to the mouth of the pipe where the clothes dryer vented to the outdoors, right at ankle level on the west side of the house, and he put the cat down and crouched in the snow and reached two fingers into the opening of that pipe. And it was there. He drew out the old key to the front door. And he walked to the front porch of the tiny house, and he tried the key. And he felt the tumblers click, and he felt the house inhale as he pushed open the door and stepped inside. Patches followed him. And there he was, standing first in the empty living room and then in the kitchen of the house where he had grown up. And you might think that a visit to an old empty house on a winter evening would be a silent experience. But it was cacophonous. The ghosts of the years he spent there were thick around him. Across the kitchen on the wall in the corner was the old yellow telephone. Next to it was a wall from which a bunch of wooden paneling had begun to be torn, surely because the house was being prepared for sale. And Mark remembered helping his mother hang that paneling over the pocked old kitchen wall. Well, now that it was coming down, he could see one of Scooter's drawings. It was drawn right onto the wall, a treasure map with dotted lines leading from the kitchen to the backyard with a big X in the yard under the apple tree. Scooter had drawn the map just as they put the paneling up. Wouldn't it be cool, she had said back then, if someday we sold the house and the people who bought it found this treasure map and went into the backyard to dig up the treasure and they wouldn't find anything because I didn't bury anything back there. I just drew the map. Man. Scooter's a weird kid, Mark muttered under his breath. And as he left the kitchen and walked into the living room, he stood there for a moment before the window, looking out on the other houses in the neighborhood. Those houses were not empty. They were filled with light. He saw people eating meals together, playing music together, decorating for Christmas together. It was all happening right now, in the present, on this Christmas Eve. And it stirred something in Mark, a kind of longing that he really didn't understand and that he couldn't put words to. And finally, he left the living room altogether and walked down the dark hall into his mother's old bedroom. It was empty. And he went to the closet and he opened the door. And on the back of the door was another of Scooter's drawings. This one showed a girl running, and in one hand, she held the hand of a doll, and cradled in the other was what looked like a glass baking dish, a rectangle with low sides and something colored red and white and yellow in it, and behind the girl was a green hill, and over the hill advanced an army of what looked like orcs or something, and above the girl's head, there was a speech balloon that said, Day Query! Save Mom's Manicotti! Scooter was so weird. 
Mark looked at the picture again, and with a rueful smile, he said out loud the words in the speech balloon in the drawing. Day query, save mom's manicotti. And right at that moment, his mother's dark bedroom filled with a pale blue light. And in the light, Mark heard a voice. It was the singing voice of his mother. There in the dark, she sang. drew in a terrified breath. He had an impulse to bolt from the room, and he tried, but he couldn't move. All he could do was open his mouth. Oh, mother, Mark cried out into the pale blue light. He fell to his knees. Oh, mother, why did you let her go away? Why did you take Scooter's side? And when I came to you for comfort, why did you go yourself and leave me here in the world alone? I drive this neighborhood when I feel sad and lonely, and that's every night of my life I feel like a ghost. I don't know where to go or what to do or how to live anymore. Mark poured out his heart until he was empty, and with the last gasp, he put his hand over his heart, and the light vanished. He took his hand away from his heart, and the light came back. He put his hand over his heart, and the light was gone again. And for the light to appear and disappear, coordinated with the placing of his hand over his heart, well... The truth was that this was getting a little weird. And coming down just a little bit from panic and fear, Mark realized that beneath his hand was something that wasn't his heart at all, something hard and rectangular. It was his phone. His phone was in his breast pocket, illuminating the room through the fabric of his shirt. And as for the music... How could Mark have possibly predicted the similarity between the phrase day query, save mom's manicotti, and the phrase hey Siri, play songs by Manati? Well, Mark laughed out loud and fell backward, and he lay there spread eagle on the floor for a long time. It took a long time to regulate his breathing and then get his head back to normal. And when he did, he sighed and stood up and walked out of his mother's bedroom. He walked back down the hall and paused in the doorway between the kitchen and the living room and the yellow phone on the kitchen wall rang. Mark fell back against the door jamb. He gasped for air again and again. The phone rang, and Mark answered it. Hello, this is Mark. It was silent on the other end of the line. And then, Mark? Who is this? It's Scooter. What are you doing at Mom's house? Well, it was kind of an awkward conversation in which they figured out what had happened. Mark learned that Scooter was on the way from New York to her place in L.A. after an audition, and the plane had been grounded in Salt Lake City by the snow, at least overnight. And she was trying to call their mom to see if someone could come and pick her up from the airport. Well, Mark told Scooter that not only did their mother not live there anymore, but that she was dead that if Scooter had stayed in the valley, she would have known that. And Scooter said, Mark, don't be ridiculous. I I talk to Mom every week on the phone. And Mark said, how could you do that? And Scooter said, listen, just because you haven't kept in touch doesn't mean I haven't. Well, they didn't hang up on each other. They kept talking. And Mark found out that his mother was not dead, that she was, in fact, doing pretty well, and that her illness had leveled out and that she was still living with cousins in the valley. 
and he found out that Scooter had two phone numbers in her phone under her mom's name, the number for the place where mom was living now, and the number for the old house. And she'd always thought about cleaning up her contact list and deleting that old number, but somehow she never had, and tonight she had simply dialed the wrong number, kind of miraculously even dialed the wrong number. The conversation between Mark and Scooter was a little stilted, as you may imagine, but they stayed on the phone for a while. And without noticing it, Mark had slid down the door jamb and was sitting on the floor with his knees up against his chest like he'd done while on the phone as a kid. Patches, who had been exploring the old house as Mark had, now rubbed himself against Mark's legs as Mark and Scooter talked. And finally... Scooter said, "Ah, I better go. I I, I gotta get a hold of someone who can come pick me up. And there was a long silence on the phone. And then Mark said, I could come pick you up. And Scooter said, You? And Mark said, Yeah. Yeah, I'll be there in about an hour. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, what then? In the end, it was only Patches who watched Mark walk out the door, lock it, and put the key back in the dryer vent. Patches and Mark crossed the yard, and Mark held the car door open for the cat, who jumped lightly into the car and settled on the passenger seat. And Mark and Patches pulled away from the old house, headed through the snow for the airport. That was a story called You Dressed as a Gypsy and I as a Clown. I wrote that story, and it makes me happy that you listened. As we head deeper into a wintry world, I hope you think about how you can heal the rifts, how you can reach out to your fellow humans, and how you can make Christmas a time of peace and joy for those around you. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this hour with you on the Appleseed, where great stories can change your family's world. We're pleased and proud to be among the many shows in the BYU Radio family of programs. You can find this episode or any episode from our archive on the BYU Radio app at byuradio.org slash Appleseed or by Googling the Appleseed Podcast. We appreciate your reviews, so if you listen on a podcast platform, leave us some feedback. I'm Sam Payne. And I can't wait to be with you again on the Appleseed. <laughs>